I don't know what y'all was thinking, but I was sitting there thinking, man, this stage is too small for all of those different talented folks that was up here this morning. Uh, plenty big for me, but not big enough for them. There's a lot of, lot of folks right here in this little church that are gifted and talented, and I thank the Lord for that. Um, there is going to be children's church this morning, so those folks could be dismissed at this time. The rest of us, if you would, stand with me. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 8. Appreciate that, Brother Cody and Miss Naomi. Uh, I appreciate those songs. Done a wonderful job. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. The scripture reads, says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to, the, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. But if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this morning, we want to say praise your high and holy name. We have so much to be thankful for, just like the song that we sung together as a congregation. Because, Lord, when we cry out to you, when we reach out and touch the hem of your garment, when we trust in you by faith to be our Savior and our Lord, confessing our sin to you, Lord, you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You give us new life in you. You give us your righteousness. You give us a hope and a purpose and a plan. You give us, Lord, uh, not only stability in the here and now, but we have something to look forward to beyond this old world. And Lord Jesus, we want to tell you that we love you today. We give you the honor and the glory and the praise. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to hide me behind the cross. I ask for a fresh anointing of your spirit to be able to preach today with, with an unction from on high. And I pray, Lord, as your word is proclaimed, I pray that wherever it goes to, that you would find the lost where they are and draw them unto yourself. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would uh, save them, that they'd be willing to turn from their sin and repentance and call on your name. And Lord, for us who are saved, we need a stirring. We need revival. We need a, a, an, an excitement in our soul and our hearts once again. Lord, we need the, 
to be focused on you, that the burdens and the cares of this world can't uh, hold us down, but instead, Lord Jesus, be that we be free as you intend us to be, free to be what you want us to be, serving you as a light in this old dark world. We ask you to move here this morning as we give you the honor and glory, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, as, a, as Thanksgiving is right around the corner, I want us to think about the need to have a thankful heart. A thankful heart. You know, you get over into 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, you're going to have some description of what it's going to be like in the last days. And it's going to talk about some of the attitudes of people in the last days. And you know what one of the attitudes is for those who live in the last days? An unthankful heart. A group of people who are not thankful to the one true and living God. And so when I think about Thanksgiving right around the corner, um, I think about more than being off work that day. Uh, even though that's, I'm so much thankful for that. Uh, but not just thinking about that or thinking about getting up in the morning and putting that turkey in or the ham in and, and then going ahead and laying back down and, and being able to, to rest a little bit longer as you smell that ham and as you smell that turkey and as you smell the casseroles keep uh, and everything else that is being cooked. Um, and I'm thankful for that too. But it's more than that. It's more than being able just to relax and to, to flip on a football game and sit back in a recliner and, and maybe look at the fire. It's more than that. When I think about Thanksgiving, I think about really the reason in which we can be thankful. And I think about the God in whom we serve, the one true and living God of the Bible, who's always been, who always will be, who created everything out of nothing, who holds everything together, who's seated upon the throne is in control even when things seem to be out of control, who, who a God who is, who is not only there high and above us and, and perfect in all of his ways, yet in spite of who we are and what we are by our own free actions, he didn't just do away with us. He didn't just leave us to ourselves. He didn't just say, well, you've made your bed, you can lie in or stay on the broad path that's going to lead you ultimately to the lake of fire and your utter destruction, if you would, for all eternity because of your own sinful ways. No, the one true and living God of the Bible who is above us, who is above sin, who is perfect in all his ways, came down to where sinful humanity was. And he enrobed himself in similar flesh and walked amongst us and he dealt with all of the temptation and sin of humanity, and he made it open spectacle as he went to the cross of Calvary and conquered it. He became our sin, and he died in our place. And I know it's a simple gospel message, and I know that I say that a very similar thing to that almost every time that I get in this pulpit about who God is and what he accomplished. But folks, at the end of the day, that's the reason that we can be thankful and everything else builds upon that fact. If we don't have a God who came down to us, who, who took on our sin and nailed to an old rugged cross, who, who then was conquered death, hell, and the grave through the resurrection from the dead, if we don't have him, then we have nothing else. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, we are of most men miserable. If the gospel be not true, if that be not the foundation, then we really have nothing to look forward to. Not on Thursday, and listen, if all you're looking forward to is the smell of a turkey or the smell of a ham or not to have to work that day, that ain't really much to look forward to, folks. You know why? Because the next day, you probably ain't smelling turkey. And the next day, you're probably at work. And the next day, all the things that you didn't have to worry about that day, you've got to worry about the next day. But when you talk about living for Jesus, folks, You've got hope, you've got thankfulness, you've got joy that is now and forevermore, irregardless of your circumstance. When I think about joy, I think about all that God does in our life, and it doesn't matter what's going on, amen? You can have joy because of who you are serving 
and the one true and living God. And the Bible talks about us having a blessed hope. The Bible talks about us having a lively hope. The Bible talks about us having a peace that passes all understanding. I'm thankful today for what God has done in my life, what he wants to do in everybody else's life, and the availability for that peace, that grace, that mercy, that joy, that love that is there for anyone and everyone who is willing to come to Jesus and live for Jesus. You know, I was talking in our Sunday school class and was praying for somebody. I won't name exactly who it was. They remember who it was. But the people I was lifting up in prayer and naming, you know, that they, they many times talk about the struggles of, of their life over this past year. And when I think about it, there's a lot of difficulties that we go through. And, and there's a lot of things that I myself have been through and so on and so forth. But the, the thing about it is when you go through this life, and the difficulties of this life. And Job says it's hard. Job says that a man that's born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. That's not the most optimistic outlook on life, is it? Job said, listen, he was, listen, nobody liked Job on the face of the earth. And yes, he went through a very difficult time. But before that time, he was rich. He was popular. He was spiritual. He had it all together. At least it appeared to be that way. And then all of a sudden, the rug was pulled out from underneath him, and his riches were gone, his family was gone, at least his children were taken from him, his popularity was taken from him, all of his buddies that he thought he had turned their backs on him. He, everything was quick. Job realized how quick life could change, and he said, man, as born of a woman, is a few days and full of trouble. He understood that. That's not a very good outlook on life, but... It's a very truthful outlook on life. But when you insert the one true and living God of the Scripture into your life, no matter what your circumstances are, guess what? Things change for your good and His glory. And so as we think about being thankful, there's just a few truths this morning I want us to see in these first 17 verses of Romans chapter 8 that we should motivate us to be thankful today. I want to think about just a few things. The first thing is we look at the first few verses. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is in, in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The first thing I want us to see here as a reason we should be thankful is that in Christ there is no condemnation. You know, today I don't worry about going to hell. I don't worry about dying and being separated from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. I don't worry about any of that. I don't worry about a white throne judgment in my future. I don't worry about the books being open and my name not being written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't worry about that today. I don't worry about the, the book of works opened up and it describing and declaring my sinfulness uh, before that white throne and seeing Jesus sitting there with fire in his eyes and ultimately saying, depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I never knew you. I don't worry about that today. Not because I'm a Baptist preacher, not because I've been baptized, not because I give my tithes and offerings, not because I teach or preach, not because I pray or not because I, I, I show up to worship services, but because on September 20th of 1998, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I recognized my own sin as the Spirit of God brought conviction in my heart, and I admitted to God and agreed with God that I was a sinner by my own actions, by my own nature, and I confessed to Him my sinfulness, and I understood and believed that because of that, I deserved the wrath of God. But even in light of all of that stuff, the cross of Calvary became a reality to me. That Jesus himself became my sin. And Jesus endured my condemnation on the cross. He was my substitute. He was my replacement on that cross. Me personally and you personally. But that day I wasn't thinking about everybody else in the world. I was thinking about God himself personally took my place. And he didn't just shed his blood and die for me. But then three days later, when he rose from the dead, he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And guess what happened? That sacrifice 
that was there on the altar of God was accepted by the Father. And when I trusted in Him as my own personal Lord and Savior, He took my sin away, folks. I mean, think about that for a minute. When we think about being born again, that's what happens. You're literally made alive in Christ. See, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, what happened to them? They spiritually died right then. Their, their, their nakedness become apparent to them. Their holiness, the innocence in which they were made, the sinlessness in which they were made, no longer existed for them. Then they now were sinners. They were separated. They saw their nakedness and was ashamed. And when they heard the voice of God, they didn't rejoice. They fled from him and tried to hide from him and tried to cover up their sin and all that it was. But when you come to Jesus, folks, he makes you alive. Through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit that comes in, guess what else happens? He takes your shame away as he takes your sin away, and then he gives you his righteousness. He clothes you again with a new coat, if you would. He does away with the old man, and he gives you and makes you a new man. When I think about being thankful today, I think about What's most important is that you and I don't have to live under condemnation. You and I have no condemnation when we are in Christ Jesus. How do you become in Christ Jesus? When you get saved. When you repent of your sin and turn to Jesus, he saves you, he forgives you, he cleanses you, and you are no longer under the condemnation of sin and law and of the holy God of the universe who is going to deal with sin in its entirety someday. He went to the cross so everybody could have forgiveness of sin and eternal, and eternal life. But if you choose not to come by the way of the cross, you will one day give an account before him. You will stand before him on your own. And you will not have the blood to cover you. You will not have the righteousness of Christ that you can plead. You will not have Jesus as your advocate. You're a lawyer to stand on behalf of you. You will have no claims there, but you will have to handle it on your own. You will one day stand before him, condemned to be sentenced ultimately to the second death, the lake of fire. Those who come to Jesus, those who are born again, those who are saved, guess what? You don't have to live in condemnation anymore because there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now look what it says. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. When we think about being saved, you're no longer condemned. You're also no longer under the law of sin and death. John chapter 11, Jesus was there about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And you remember Mary and Martha, they, they were tore all to pieces because they had sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, and it looked as if he was sick unto death. And when Jesus got the word, he looks at his disciples and he says, it's all right, he'll be fine. And as they were sitting there uh, doing their thing, eventually he makes his way back. But Lazarus had died. He literally was dead. And Jesus said everything was going to be fine. Truly wasn't sick unto death. Jesus would have known better, right? But Jesus shows up and Mary and Martha are there. And, and Martha, and, or Mary rather, gets her, listen, if, you, if you'd just been here a little bit earlier, our brother would not be dead. And Jesus says, don't have to worry about it. Your brother's going to live again. And they said, in the resurrection of the last days? And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's a pretty awesome statement. And then he asked him, do you believe this? And some people would say, hold on a second, Lazarus de was dead, and he believed, and there's people today that believe and are dead. No, not really, because when a person dies, this old body gives way, this old fleshly sinful body, when it's one breaking down as we speak, when it gives way, guess what happens, folks? The, the soul, the spirit of man doesn't die. It goes into the presence of Almighty God. 
And so those who die in Christ Jesus enter into the presence of the Lord, and they're not dead. They're alive, probably alive more than they've ever been before, and they're awaiting a glorified body, but they're not dead. No, no, to leave this world, to be absent from this body, is to be present with the Lord. And so when we think about being thankful today, guess what? You don't have to fear as a saved person. Not only being in condemnation, but you don't have to live in fear of death anymore. And I know that nobody wants to face necessarily death. You know, well, we're not over here just, you know, hey, you know, bring on death. I don't think that's the case. But what you and I can understand is that we don't have to live in fear of death anymore because that greatest enemy has been conquered through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's why he said, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. Because he's the one that conquered death. When Jesus, who is the life, as he claimed to be in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he claimed that and he proved that, right? Because not only is he the life giver, but when he went to the cross of Calvary and shed his blood and he gave up his life, Death didn't even have control over him in that sense. Nobody could take his life, but he laid down his life. You know, he said it is finished, right? Because he accomplished what a holy, righteous God needed or, or his, it need, had to have demanded, rather, because of his nature to deal with sin. And so Jesus becomes our sin, he sheds his blood, and he says, it is finished, and he gave up his life. But what happened three days later? The grave couldn't hold him, right? Sin couldn't hold him, death couldn't hold him. Why? Because he's the life. And so he comes back to life to never die again. And so when we trust in him as our own personal Lord and Savior, we're not condemned. You don't have to go about in this life oh, with your head hanging down. Not because you're perfect and of yourself, but because the one you trust in is perfect. See, we go in the name of Jesus. We're covered by the righteousness of Jesus. We, we, we are made perfect because of the person and the works of Jesus. Not because of what we do. Not because of who we are and of ourselves. No, we are in him, right? I mean, that's is a picture. It's the only thing I can picture being in him is just that. If you could picture what Jesus would look like, and I don't know what that is, but if you picture him, and then inside of him, it's like you're drawn inside of him. You're inside of him, literally. He lived a perfect life, you lived a perfect life. He went to the cross, you went to the cross. He was buried, you were buried. He was raised from the dead, he, you were, he was raised from the dead, you were raised from the dead. He's never going to die again. You're never going to die again. He is per perfect and without sin. You are perfect without sin. When you trust in him, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, you are free from the law of death and the law of sin. When I think about being thankful today, how many understand that in Christ Jesus, you do not have to be in bondage to your old sinful ways or any sin, period. Now, I'm not saying that you and I are going to reach sinless perfectionism on this side of glory. 1 John chapter 1 plainly says, if you say you're without sin, the act of sin, then you're a liar. You don't understand. Nobody here can say, well, I, didn't, I, I never sinned. You know, we're going to sin occasionally, whether it's sin of omission or sin of commission, either which way, the, the way we think sometimes, what we say, what we do, what we don't do, to know to do good and not to do it to us, it is sin. That doesn't mean that you and I, though, should just have a freedom to go sin. No, this tells us that you and I are no longer under the bondage of sin. Whom the Son makes free is free indeed, folks. Jesus conquered your sin on the cross of Calvary. So that means you and I don't have to go about in this life controlled by sin. You know, you don't have to talk ways. It's not proper. You don't even have to think. No, no, Satan is, Satan is a master of a lot of things, and he'll try to plant some things in your mind, but you don't have to dwell on those things forever. You know, he might try to bring about a temptation in your mind, but, but you can put that thought to bed. 
You don't have to continue to dwell on that or it dwells from there and it comes about an action in your life. You, you don't have to, to be under the control of the old man anymore. And he's not completely done away with, so to speak. But that's why Paul said, every day I die. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not that I live, but now I live by the faith of the Son of God, right? Who died and gave his life for me. And Jesus said it like this. If you're going to be my disciple, you've got to take up your cross daily, die to yourself, right? And, and live for Jesus. That's what has to happen. So you've got to make a conscious effort to put the old man to death every single day. But do you hear what I'm saying? You put him to death. He's not in control, right? You let Jesus be in control of your life every day. You don't have to be that old person anymore. You don't have to live in that. You don't have to live in that past anymore. You know, it's like the old preacher said, hey, anytime the devil wants to remind you of your past, just remind him of his future. You know, and I think that's true. Also, nobody else can hang your past over your head once you come to know Jesus. Because the God in whom you're going to give an account to, he don't. You know why? Because he already dealt with it. Ain't no double jeopardy with him. You know why? Because when he does something, he does it right. He dealt with it. He took care of it. He conquered it. He went to the cross. He shed his blood. He gave his life. He rose from the dead. The stone couldn't hold him. The seal couldn't hold him. The soldiers couldn't hold him. Sin couldn't hold him. Nothing could hold him down there. Satan couldn't hold him. Never going to be able to hold him. He conquered it. And so sin no longer has dominion over you. You died with him. You rose again with him when you trust Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior. Now, you should be thankful for that today. You know? Because when you, can, when you can be thankful in light of some of these little truths, everything else falls into place. It really does. When you get saved, that's not the end. Forgiveness is not the end. Justification is just not the end of it. That's the beginning of it. And he starts working on you. He starts shaping you. He starts molding you. You start to live in light of you're no longer condemned. You're a child of God. You're no longer in darkness, you're in the light. You're no longer dead in your trespass and sin, you're made alive to walk in the newness of, of life in Christ. You and I are now a children of God, not the children of the devil anymore. You're not hell bound, now you're heaven bound. You walk with your head up in the righteousness of Jesus. Right? No condemnation. So, can your past be embarrassing to you? Sure. Should you want to rejoice in the past? No. Do you want to gloat in what you used to be? No. But you can walk with your head up in Christ Jesus because that may have been what I used to be, but that ain't who I am today. In Christ Jesus, it's different. I don't have to worry about condemnation because Jesus has saved me has forgiven me. That law of the spirit of life, it's in Christ Jesus, it's made me free from the law of sin and from death. Be thankful. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Or not, you know what else I'm thankful for? Not just that I'm not condemned anymore. Not just because I've been delivered from the law of sin and death. But I'm thankful today that Jesus, in sinful flesh, condemned sin. I'm not condemned, but because He condemned sin in the flesh. If you think about living in this life, we say it all the time, man, it's, it's hard to live in this world. It's full of trouble, but it's hard. It's hard to live for Jesus. But you can, right? You can. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to live depressed. You don't have to live defeated. You don't have to live discouraged. You can live in victory today 
Because what the law could not do, and the law never had the purpose of delivering us. And then when we talk about the law, we just use just the Ten Commandments, if you would. The Ten Commandments are enough to condemn the world of sin, right? I mean, there's not a, there's not a person one that can live out the Ten Commandments. They can't. And, and, and even if you could, so to speak, you're born with a sin nature, so it wouldn't do you no good anyway. The law was never intended to change the nature of a human being. The law was there to teach the person that their nature needed to be changed. That's the purpose. It was to let you know that you can't live in a way where God's number one in your life. You can't live in a way where where you're not taking the Lord's name in vain. You can't live in a way where where you're not making something else, some graven image. People say, well, I don't do that. Yes, we do. If we're not careful, we make God into our own liking. We're serving and worshiping idols pretty regular if we're not careful. He's not number one in our life like he needs to be. When you start looking at the law, you say, man, I can't do that. Just our relationship with him, our relationship with others. It's a struggle. Lying, stealing. Huh? Somebody said, well, I ain't never murdered. Well, if you hate your brother, you're guilty of it. I ain't never committed adultery. If you lust in your heart, you're guilty of it. You know, these folks, they think, well, I'm not as bad as the next person. But the problem is you ain't as good as God. So when you think about that and you start examining your own life, all of a sudden it's like, oh, no. I'm in bad shape. There's nothing I can do to fix it. But this verse, on the other hand, says this, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came and fulfilled the law, right? And then he didn't just fulfill the law, but he condemned sin in the flesh. He did what we can't do. Huh? Is it when you think about it, you been in a spot where you just, I can't do something, so you need to call somebody else to do it? Most men in this room can identify with that. Most men in this room think they're plumbers until they start plumbing. Huh? If you're like me, before you fix it, you broke something else. Huh? And then, and then you learn how to, you may eventually be good at what you do, but it takes up time. What's the, what's the easiest way, though? Find somebody who knows what they're doing. Right? I mean, if you can find somebody that knows what they're doing, it's going to fix it the first time. Well, there's a lot of times in this world I start learning. I'm not a very good plumber. I do all right, but, but man, it's, it's, there's somebody else better than me in it. Same thing with an electrician, same thing with a mechanic. There's a lot of things, you know, out there in the world that I might be able to get by on certain things, but, you know, I, I, call, I don't call myself a master at anything, you know. Call somebody out there who knows what they're doing. Well, you know, when I look at my own life, I think, man, I can't fix it. When I'm left to myself, I make a mess of it, you know. When I start thinking on what I think's right, when I try to navigate through this world, Trying to, trying to make sense of what's going on in this world? I can't do it. I can't do it. But I come back over here and I say, God, I say, you took care of my, you took care of my sin. You, you came here into this old world. God took on human form. He walked among sinful humanity. And what the law couldn't do, he did. Because he fulfilled the law and then he he condemned sin through a sinless life. He did it all. Never sinned one time. Jesus never thought the wrong thought, never spoke the wrong word. He did everything he was supposed to do. That's pretty amazing, right? That wasn't even enough to condemn, condemn sin, though. He did everything perfect, and then he who knew no sin was made our sin. That's how he condemned it. He said, he said, not only will I show y'all how to live a perfect life, I'm going to go ahead and take the sin that y'all have here, and then I'm going to deal with it. 
And so he became our sin. And then he went to our cross. And then how did he condemn it? The wrath of the Father was poured out on him. And then he rose again, overcoming it. You said, Brother Anthony, you said he came here, he died on the cross, he rose again. You've said that about 20 times already. Good. I'm glad you counted. Because that's exactly what he did. And that's exactly what he had to do. God had to become a man. God had to live the perfect life we failed to do. God had to take on our sin. God had to shed his blood because that's where the life is. It's in the blood. He had to die because the wage of sin is death. But he had to take his life up again because if he didn't, the sacrifice would be insufficient. But he overcame it through the resurrection. So you and I don't have to live in condemnation. We don't have to live under the power of the law of death and the law of sin. And you and I also can understand that he condemned sin. We overcame sin through him. We can be thankful for this. He says that the righteousness, look what it says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit of God, you and I can be what God intends us to be. You ought to be thankful today. Because God did not just forgive you. He came to change you. That's pretty awesome. To make you alive in Christ. So he began the good work in you to one day bring it to completion. When I think about the fact that he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that in Christ Jesus, you know, though any man that's in Christ, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So he shapes us and he molds us. And before you couldn't do a thing to please God. Now, through the Spirit of God, you and I can fulfill the law of God. How? Jesus did it for us. The Spirit of God who he sent after he ascended came inside of us so we can live after the Spirit, not after the flesh. So he says, those who don't walk after the flesh will walk after the Spirit. They can fulfill, it says, the righteousness of the law could be fulfilled. Verse 5 says, and they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For, the, to, for to be carnally minded is death. To be after the flesh means you're going to die. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Think about this whole world right here. Isn't not death on every hand? Every time you turn around, it's something. I'm telling you, it's crazy, you know. It's just, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's not just shootings either, you know. You got shootings every time you turn around. Well, there's four college students that were stabbed to death, if, if I read the article right, remember right, just the other day. I mean, I think about that. I think about my kid about to be, about to be able to go to school. And I don't know all the details yet, but that's four of them killed with a knife. I guess you do away with guns, you have to do away with knives, you have to figure out, do away with rocks, you have to do away with everything, because they're going to kill somebody with something. Hammers, that's right, that's for Mr. Pelosi. He just didn't die. There's a lot of crazy stuff that goes on in this world. It's not funny, but it is funny. There's a lot of crazy stuff that's in this world, folks. You say, how in the world, how are we going to be able to do things? Well, the carnally minded folks bring about death. That's all there is to it. But Jesus is not death. Jesus is life. And you know what, you know what I get so happy about? That I can live in life and peace in the midst of a world that's living in carnality. I don't have to live in that. I don't have to be among all that carnage. I don't have to be amongst all that death. I can live in life. I can live in peace when the world's in turmoil. Isn't that good news today? I mean, that, that to me is, is a whole lot to be thankful for. That makes me want to eat turkey today. That's how thankful I am. Huh? I mean, we ought, we ought to be able to celebrate every single day. We ought to get burnt out on turkey. 
Huh? I mean, because we ought to be thankful. He says this, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. But it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then we, or, or so, rather, it says, so then they, or so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But look what it says in verse 9. Here's another thing to be thankful for. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's so that the Spirit of God dwelt in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And he said, what are you thankful for here? Well, because we're not of the flesh anymore. When you get saved, the Spirit of God comes into you immediately. Not sometime down the road. Now, some people teach that. Some people teach you saved today, and you got to pray later on to receive the Spirit of God. But Romans chapter 8, just as we just read in verse 9, teaches us plainly that you're not of the flesh anymore, that you're in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now look what it says. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. You cannot be saved and not have the Spirit of God. Because when the Spirit of God is not in you, you're not his. But when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes inside of you so you no longer have to live in the flesh. That's something to be thankful for. Because if it isn't for the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, you and I are in very terrible shape. We can't do anything on our own. But Jesus said, I'm going to send forth my spirit, and he did. And the day of Pentecost took place in Acts chapter 2, and the church was birthed, and the permanent dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit started in that group of folks. And from that point on, every person that was saved, born again, brought to the body of Christ, receives the Holy Spirit of God. And now you and I can live in the Spirit. And therefore, we don't have to be an enemy to God. The carnal minds and enmity against God can't even be subject to the law of God. But when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes inside of you. Guess what? You're no longer an enemy of God. You're a child of God. Now you can be subject to the law of God. See, those that don't know Christ, they don't understand the Bible. The Bible is a spiritually discerned book. When they study it, they say, well, they, can, they might... There might be some folks that can quote you some Bible verse, but to understand it, for it to benefit them, no, you've got to be saved. You've got to have the greatest teacher, the Holy Spirit of God, inside your life. We need to be thankful today because the Spirit of God is in us. We can be not enemies of God, but we are to be now subject to the ways and the will of God who is, you know, He's ours. He's our God. It says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's why the process of salvation has to be complete. You get justified, you're forgiven of your sin. You go through the process of sanctification. That means he's making you more like him in the here and now. But one day you're going to get a glorified body. And that's the completion of our salvation. Because this old body of sin it is still an issue, right? But one day it's going to be put aside and we're going to get a glorified body. And that's the complete finished process of salvation. You know, it's like one said, you, you talk about, you know, it's like a triangle, if you would. You can, you know, one side of that triangle is justification. The other side is sanctification. The third side is glorification. That gets you the, the idea of salvation. Okay. As one person can say like this, I was saved. I'm being saved. I'm going to be saved. Because in the past, I was justified. It's a one-time thing. You don't have to keep getting forgiven over and over and over as far as initially for your salvation. Okay, you're justified. Right then, he pardons you. You're being saved as he's delivering you from the power of sin through the process of sanctification. One day, you're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. And you get a glorified body. And so justification, sanctification, glorification, but we're looking forward to a new body, right? And I've got something to be thankful for because you and I, in Christ Jesus, we can, we can live in righteousness, but it says here that the body, this body here is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And it says in verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and he does, 
He that quickened up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. But if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the, ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as, look what it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. you be thankful today because those that are saved, those folks become children of Almighty God. The Spirit of God indwells us that we can now live according to the law of God. And here it says here that we can be led by the Spirit of God. In fact, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Daddy. Somebody got offended one time. I used the term daddy. Got an anonymous letter that offended them. I figure somebody can't put their name to it. I ain't sweating it. But I don't know what's so offensive about it. It's not one thing disrespectful to God. Have any of y'all as parents, especially you fathers, you ever been offended when your little kid, your little child, your little girl, your little boy looks at you with big eyeballs and says, Daddy? I ain't never been offended. You melt. You don't get offended. Right? I mean, when they somebody say, Father, not that that's disrespectful. That's very respectful. But there's something a little more intimate about daddy. And let me tell you something. Shall we honor God as God? Absolutely. Is he our heavenly father? We have that privilege if you're saved that you call him your heavenly father. But here seems to be a little more of a, a title of endearment. We're in crowd, Abba, Father, unto him. I, I get the picture of my kids crawling up in my lap. And I, I get the picture of me crawling up in God's lap. Where I, or I can cry out to him as, as my, my, my father, my dad, you know? It's just, in this passage of Scripture, man, I'm thankful for that. Especially when I think about the, the fact that when I was growing up, I didn't really have a dad. My real father, he, he left, never was much of a father to me. He's passed away now. My stepdad, who was in the picture, is an alcoholic and drug addict, and he caused more turmoil than he did any good while he was alive. He's passed away, too, you know. Uh, you know, and then my mom, who played both of those roles for a lot of time in my life, she's no longer here neither. My grandpa, who, who was somewhat of a father figure, though he never really tried to be my dad, he was a father-type figure, and I lived with him for 18 years of my life. He's no longer here neither. So all those folks that had some type of, you know, influence in my life from a father's standpoint, they're no longer here. And many of those folks, they weren't the best example anyway. But God, he says to me, I will be your father. You can cry out to me as Abba father. You're joint heirs as it goes on to say in verse 17. Join ours with Jesus. He owns it all. I get in on that. Hello? There's a lot to be thankful for today. When I think about the God of the universe, He's not just a God who cares about His creation because He made everything and He holds it together, but He's a God who came down to us. And He's not only a God who came down to us and walked amongst us, He's a God that after he dealt with our sin, he sends the right hand of the Father, he sends the third person of the Trinity to come into us. You don't get any closer than that. You know, you just hear people talk about, you know, oh man, if I was, I was alive when Jesus was alive, I mean, disciples, they walk with Jesus. You don't get any closer than the Holy Spirit inside of us. Even Jesus says to his disciples before he ascends, hey, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send another one like it unto myself. And what happened? You see what happened with Peter? 
Peter walked side by side with Jesus, didn't he? And he did a lot of good things, but he also did some foolish things, didn't he? He was a chicken too, wasn't he? He wasn't near as tough. You know, fishermen, you think they'd be pretty tough. And he was probably in a lot of ways. He cut one guy's ear off. But then when he got confronted by some woman about knowing Jesus, he cussed and denied. You know? Not like a Baptist to me. What, what happened, though, on the day of Pentecost? That same Jesus who is indwelt by the power and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit of God, when he got another chance to confront those same people that he was scared of before, guess what? He had a boldness he never had. So when I think about folks saying, well, if I was back then when Jesus was here, it'd be different. Or if I was there when Moses and the waters of the Red Sea was spread or with Joshua and the, and, and, and the Jordan River was spread or, or when the walls of Jericho fell or, or if I was there when, and when Elijah was caught up and I got to see it like Elisha did, I'd be different than what I am today. But we don't see all those types of things. Hold on, the third person of the Trinity dwells every single one of us believers. We have the inspired and there and infallible, the complete revelation of the Word of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. I don't think we need much more than the Word of God and the Spirit of God for you and I to be what God intends us to be. Man, we can be thankful today. We've got a lot to be thankful for, just like Stephanie sang that old song. In fact, I'm going to ask Stephanie to sing that song, The Invitation, again. So you guys can find that back there on the screen in a minute. And that's what I want her to sing. Some of y'all, it was a new song, I can tell. But it's a, it's a good song. And when we sing that song in a moment, this altar is going to be open. And you're going to be able to say, you know what, I, I have a lot to be thankful for. And you know what we ought to do with the, thank, with, with, the, with the things that we have that we're thankful for? We ought to turn around and give them back to God. And so you're going to have an opportunity in a moment to come. And you think about the things that you're thankful for, those blessings, those every good gift that comes down from the Father of lights, those things are not for you and I to worship. Those things are for you and I to turn around and give them back in an act of praise and thankfulness to the one true and living God. So whatever it is that you're thinking about today, but maybe there might be somebody here today who say, you know what, I've never been saved. I've never been saved. Well, today's the day for you to come and give your life to Jesus. You know, you can try to be thankful today but you're not completely understanding it. I tried to celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas for 18 years of my life. But it wasn't until I got saved that I actually understand what Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter was all about. I didn't understand it. I didn't realize that Christmas wasn't just about, you know, but it is about a gift. It is, really is. But it's not about the gift that's under the tree. It's about the gift that was on the tree. You know, I didn't understand all of that. I didn't understand, you know, really why I should be thankful, you know. And people say, well, Thanksgiving was never a Christian holiday. What are you talking about, Elaine? What are you talking about? The pilgrims were Christian folks who came over here for religious freedoms. And God whom they were following after was the one true and living God of the Bible, right? I didn't know anything about that either. But those pilgrims didn't get a big boat and come over here on the Mayflower just for no reason. So they decided to go out on the lake. No, they came over here. Many of them didn't make it. But they came over here because they wanted to follow after the one true and living God. That's what they came over here for. And guess what they did when they met the Indians, who were pagans, by the way. They told them about the one true and living God, that they might be saved. So when Thanksgiving comes along, Christmas comes along, and we, we think about this whole time of the year. Because we got a lot to be thankful for. Have a grateful, thankful heart. What about you today? If you've never known Christ, you'd come to him today. You understand you're a sinner just like we read. And apart from Jesus, you'll never be able to please God. 
you eventually will find yourself standing before him to be cast in a lake of fire for all eternity. Will you be judged? Because you didn't come to Christ. But you don't have to do that. You can repent of your sin today. You can come to Jesus today. You can ask him to come into your life and on the authority of God's word, he will save you. Did you come to him? What about you today? Miss Stephanie, will you come? And those are going to help with the invitation. And we're going to sing that song. You know, got so much to thank him for. But before we do, we're going to pray. This altar is going to be open for you to come. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you in the name of Jesus, thanking you so much for who you are. And yes, we do have so much to be thankful for. And, and Lord, um, I pray that you would just begin to flood our minds and our hearts with your many blessings as we think about and reflect upon how good you are. Maybe we can go back to the time when we got saved. We can think about where we've been uh, on that road of salvation up to this point today. You think about how good you've been even through the most difficult times as we walk through the valleys of life on that road. We've been on the mountaintops of life as we've been on this road and journey. And there's been some very difficult times where we need you to, to carry us. There's been some blessings that you've poured out in abundance that we just can't even, can't even completely describe all the things. Lord, I pray that as we contemplate that it would bring us to our knees as we seek your face. And I pray for someone lost in their sin today that they would come to you before it's everlasting too late. You're the one that uh, gives us the possibility to live without condemnation, to live not under the law of sin and death anymore, uh, but instead that we can live in a way that's pleasing to you, that we can be considered uh, children of God, and we can cry out to you as Abba Father. So Lord, I pray you work in our hearts. If there's someone lost that needs to be saved, they would come and give their life to you today. As you spoke to us, may we respond to you in this invitation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.